My name is Bob Billington. I direct the Blackstone Valley Tourism Council and manage the visitor center here. Um, it was a pleasure and an honor when we were called by the congressman to say we've exceeded the limits of the space that we had planned for this event and can you accommodate us? And of course we said we could. And then the numbers kept growing. So we apologize if you're a little bit tight, um, but we'll, it's, it's going to be obviously a, a worthwhile afternoon. Um, the Tourism Council, Council manages the visitor center but it's actually operated uh, and owned by the city of Pawtucket. So I'd like to introduce you to a longtime New Englander who's representing Mayor Grevian today, who's finally come back from uh, working out on the West Coast, working in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Mike DeBolio is our new city planner. Please welcome Mike. Thanks, Bob. Um, as, as Bob mentioned, uh, we are delighted to see this kind of crowd in this wonderful facility that celebrates the history of the Blackstone Valley and the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. It's uh, great to have you all here today. On behalf of Mayor Don Grevian, I welcome you and hope you enjoy the uh, presentation uh, this afternoon. Um, it's especially gratifying for us to uh, welcome Congressman uh, David Cicilline, and also um, Director Christy Hager from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, it's a real treat for us to be able to uh, welcome these folks here and to benefit from the work that they do on our behalf. And so, as uh, Bob mentioned, I, I've been here very briefly, so my remarks will be equally brief because I really don't know a lot about the area to say at this point. But um, I'm here to learn as well as you are, so on with the show. So today, um, as we all know, um, the economy is changing, the world is changing. Um, you can tell by the attendance in this, in this room that the, the interest and in how we do our work and bring it up to the federal government and how the federal government does its work and brings it down to the people that make it work here in Rhode Island, that that interest is deep and vibrant and alive. Um, I couldn't be more excited uh, that you're all here. It allows us to tell the story a little bit about the Blackstone Valley, but I couldn't be more excited that Congressman Cicilline who's no stranger to the work here in Pawtucket. I raced with the, when he was the mayor, on, on a dragon boat on the Pawtucket River. We <laughs> lost. Uh, and, and yeah, I wasn't going to tell him that you lost, but <laughs> since you did, since you did, Congressman. And um, just recently, uh, the Congressman was with us as we laid a memorial brick uh, for the people in Japan that lost their life as a result of the tsunami and the earthquake. We did that together with uh, Council Gentleman Heike Hara uh, from Japan. And, um, but uh, Congressman Cicilline was elected, of course, to serve in the first con congressional district here on November 2nd last year. He's a member of Congress. Um, he didn't see me, but I was in D.C. Uh, just about three weeks ago, and it was fun to see the House in session and say, there's my congressman down there doing his job, and, and thank you for doing that. But he's always been a strong voice for Rhode Island, of course, Providence, but now the entire First District here. Great advocate in Washington as he fights to create uh, well-paying jobs. It's important for, for us. Uh, green energy, which is important for us here on the Blackstone River, of course, and all these initiatives that protect the environment, which is the stage that we're working on. If we think about sustainability, we think about people. That's what the business that you're all in. We think about the environment and we think about jobs. And I think the congressman puts it all very, very well together. Um, he's concerned about our nation's schools. Uh, he's concerned about education. Um, he's and committed to rebuilding manufacturing, the manufacturing center. And uh, sorry to keep promoting the Blackstone Valley, but this is what I do on a regular basis. This is ground zero where America's industry began. And it's right, it's right that the congressman thinks that this is important because we need to rebuild that. So thank you, congressman, for that. 
Um, and what we want to be able to do is make the availability of American products uh, again for American people. So the congressman is going to lead the effort to bring um, our new our, our new effort to get people to get our men and women out of Afghanistan. If you've been watching the news, you can see that um, what's been written is what's happening right now. The president is talking about that this very moment. Um, so thank you, Congressman, for calling this session. We appreciate you being here. Welcome to the microphone, Congressman David Sisson. Thank you all uh, for being here, and thank you, Bob, for that nice introduction. And uh, I really want to thank everyone for being here today at uh, our first uh, of a series of federal grant uh, workshops. Um, the workshop today focuses on competitive funding opportunities that are currently available through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm going to introduce Christy in a moment, but I want to acknowledge two other uh, of my colleagues in government, Councilman Kevin Jackson from the City of Providence, and thank him for being here and Councilman James DeOsa from the City of Central Falls. Thank you both for being here. Um, uh, I know that uh, the key to success for many people in this room and for the organizations that you represent include grant funding for capacity building, uh, implementation of broad evidence-based policy, uh, programming, and infrastructure changes. And uh, that's why we're all here today, to really to connect you with the resources you need uh, to do the work that's successfully in your organizations, even when federal funding opportunities have changed dramatically. Um, as you all know, we're confronted with pretty serious budget challenges in Washington and very severe cuts in, in the federal budget. At the same time, uh, we ended earmarks uh, in the Congress, <coughs> making it more difficult for programs in Rhode Island to do the critical work that they do, that all of you do. Um, especially at a time when the need for health and human services is at the, you know, some of the highest levels they've ever been, um, particularly because of the very fragile economy in our state. So I see one of my responsibilities as a member of Congress from our great state uh, to, is to make sure that you have the resources you need and access to those resources from the federal government to effectively serve uh, this community in our state. And so uh, I want you to know that I am working very hard on uh, protecting uh, health care reform. Um, that's an important priority for me. I think an important priority for a lot of us in the Congress. And um, there are those in the, the leadership of the Congress on the other side of the aisle who have tried since we got there to repeal critical health care reforms that were achieved in the Affordable Health Care Act. And the consequences of that, I, I think, would be really tragic in Rhode Island. It would mean, for example, uh, uh, allowing insurance companies to deny coverage to as many as 54,000 children with pre-existing conditions in our state. It would mean increasing the number of uninsured Rhode Islanders by 36,000. It would mean restricting access to health coverage for 3,600 young adults in Rhode Island. It would mean eliminating tax credits for as many as 27,000 small businesses. It would result in raising the cost of prescription drugs for 18,700 seniors in Medicare Part D uh, donut hole. It would deny preventive care to about 178,000 seniors in our state. And it would increase the cost to hospitals providing un uncompensated care by over $50 million annually. So the effects of repealing the Affordable Care Act would be very, very severe in our state. And um, one of my responsibilities and in, in, in one of the reasons I think I was sent to Washington was to fight for Rhode Islanders, obviously, and I will continue to do everything that I can to make sure that Rhode Islanders have access to quality affordable health care. So um, I, I just want to give you a quick update before we begin the presentation of where we are um, on the uh, implementation of the Affordable Health Care Act. In the 15 months since the President signed the act into law, uh, significant progress uh, has been made already on improving uh, our nation's health care. Um, in fact, according to a report that was released just yesterday about the impact of afford the Affordable Care Act on seniors, they concluded that over 5.5 million Medicare beneficiaries use one or more of the preventive benefits, such as mammograms or colonoscopies, now covered under the new health care reform law. So over 5.5 million seniors had access to preventive care. Uh, over 780,000 beneficiaries received an annual wellness visit in the last six months. And those are um, usually important not only to the health and well-being of the people uh, that receive those services, but also in reducing health care costs, because ultimately prevention and wellness are one of our key strategies to do that. Other improvements for Medicare beneficiaries under the Affordable Care Act include 
as you all know, closing the donut hole by 2020 so that seniors can more easily afford the prescription drugs they need to uh, remain healthy, wringing out the waste, fraud, and abuse that exists in Medicare so that we can extend the life of the program uh, by making the money going to uh, work uh, for a longer amount of time. And there's also been vital insurance reforms under the Affordable Care Act, including uh, insurance companies can no longer discriminate against kids with pre-existing conditions. They can no longer impose they can no longer impose annual or lifetime caps on coverage, which is really important, so that you aren't in the middle of treatment for a very serious illness. They say, "Oh, you reached your cap. Sorry, you're on your own," which is just you know which occurred all the time, uh, and also um, dropping coverage when people are the most ill. Uh, it also is ensuring that young adults can stay on their parents' health insurance plans until they're age 26. Um, insurance companies are also now mandated under the Act to use at least 80% of their premium dollars on health care expenses instead of big salaries and bonuses for CEOs. So we're really directing that the money go into health care. Uh, it also provides for greater oversight to prevent unreasonable premium increases, which is also very important. And it also, the Health Care Reform Act provides resources to help um, underserved communities, and we've obviously seen it already here in Rhode Island. It provides increased financial support for Rhode Island's community health centers to help meet the really growing demand for primary health care services in many neighborhoods all across our state. It offers incentives such as grants and scholarships and loan repayment programs for doctors and nurses and health care professionals to serve communities that are facing shortages in these areas, in these areas which is also very important. Um, and I know there have been so many people in our state since the enactment of uh, the health reform law that have been working really, really hard and really smartly uh, uh, about its implementation, not only to uh, adopt the initiatives that are in the act, but to really become a leader in the country uh, in its implementation. And uh, we're already doing that. Rhode Island has received already nearly $40 million in grants through the Affordable Care Act. Uh, $1 million to plan for the, our, our health exchanges here in Rhode Island. $4.1 million to support capital development in community health centers, and $1.3 million for maternal infant work to do to make sure that the reforms are implemented and implemented in a way that really serve Rhode Island families and a way that ensures that Rhode Islanders have access to the quality of affordable health care that they need. With all of this in mind, um, I've assembled uh, the panel today to really help guide you through the grant opportunities that are currently available <coughs> at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and to be sure that we maximize our opportunities as a community, as a state, to uh, get all of those dollars we can brought to our state. Uh, and to kick off our panel, we are really fortunate to welcome Christy Hager. And uh, Christy was appointed the Regional Director of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Region 1, in April of 2010. Uh, previously, she was Chief Health Counsel to the Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives during the development the drafting and the implementation of the Massachusetts Health Reform Law. So she um, is a national leader already before she began her work uh, with the administration. She is also a faculty member at the Harvard University School of Public Health and has taught at graduate programs all across New England. She holds a BA from Smith College, a Master's in Public Health from Boston University School of Public Health, and a JD from the University of Connecticut School of Law. Um, so she has a distinct and experienced background and I know she, she's doing a spectacular job in her new position. I know she's going to be a great presenter today. And I welcome her and thank her for being here. And we're done. Christy, welcome you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Congressman. I don't need to tell all of you, you knew long before I did what a, um, a treasure Congressman Cicilline is for all of you um, and how well he serves his constituents. And you heard already, in fact, he scooped me on a lot of what I was just about to talk about because he knew it already and he's been so committed um, to our efforts on um, sustaining the successes and the momentum of health reform already. Um, I have been privileged to um, represent Secretary Kathleen Sebelius to the six New England states for the past year and two months. Um, and I am um, pleased to say that I've had some wonderful opportunities to come to Rhode Island um, as well as the other uh, states. But I've, I've been to visit um, Thunder Mist, just a few examples, Thunder Mist Community Health Center in Woonsocket twice. Um, I had a wonderful visit and spent a great deal of time with the staff and teachers and parents at 
children's friend um, recently in Providence. Um, and I actually also had a chance, and you would think this is an unlikely place for a U, uh, Health and Human Services Regional Director to visit, but I visited the town, uh, town Lanes Bowling Alley in Johnston, <laughs> where um, Representative Farrow talked to us about the benefits that he has as an employer, a small business um, employer, um, realized from the Affordable Care Act, who uh, he, in his providing health insurance to all of his employees, um, found that this year, under the Affordable Care Act, because of the percentage of the premium that he was contributing, he received a $10,000 tax credit, uh, just under the Affordable Care Act. So as, um, as unlikely a place as it might sound, um, and I have to say, while I was there, I met a great deal of Medicare beneficiaries. <laughs> so um, Affordable Care Act is everywhere. And I'm going to um, very um, um, relatively quickly um, orient you to the structure of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the, the structure in particular of the regional office. There are 10 regions of the U.S. Department, but one, Region 1, which is the six New England states, is headquartered in Boston. Um, so I want to make sure that you understand that um, it is um, we who are based in Boston who are closest to you and um, charged very clearly by Secretary Sebelius, a, very, a former governor who used to run a state, um, that we should be very closely supporting all of you and identifying what the needs are and what the gaps are in services and how the department can be um, more helpful. And in addition to this, to, to your um, Representative Cicilline and the, and the other members of your congressional delegation, whom we're fortunate to be able to work with in partnership um, on the goals of the Affordable Care Act, um, Governor Chafee and Lieutenant Governor Roberts and your Health Insurance Commissioner, Chris Kohler, um, are all very close, um, some of our close colleagues in Rhode Island. So I'll be able to go through some of the um, the orientation to the regional office. I'm joined today. I am also very pleased to say um, my by my colleagues um, who represent some of the divisions who have a presence in the regional office, including Joe Carlin from the Administration on Aging, Helen Mulligan from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Marilyn Lasky from the Administration for Children and Families, and Jeff Beard from HRSA, Health Resources and Services Administration, and our, our colleague in the regional office, Dave Abdu, is back there somewhere, who uh, works with us on um, intergovernmental affairs. So um, they are going to talk to you about the money. And I'm going to talk, um, again, about the structure of the regional office, but also some of the overview um, of the Affordable Care Act. Because as I said, um, whether you're um, here today representing a community-based organization, um, a for-profit entity, a uh, uh, small business, a large business. Um, there are, uh, there's a lot in, in this for you. Uh, Congressman Sicily referred to my previous experience working on Massachusetts health reform. Um, this, like our, what the law that was enacted in Massachusetts several years ago, is vast, it's complicated, there's a lot of moving parts. The good news is there's something in it for everyone, so I'm gonna, share some of that with you. First good news is that we can call it by its short name, Affordable Care Act. Um, although President Obama had to sign two pieces of legislation to affect it. Um, here's a um, map of the United States. You can see 10 regions. Um, we, in this very naturally um, um, affiliated, geographically compact region of the six New England states, where we have a lot of opportunities right off the bat for regional collaborations and um, identifying um, some of the strengths that we have in our, the, the tremendous assets in this region. Um, this, not meant for you to be able to read every word, this is the or organizational chart of, of HHS, which is on the website, and it lists every division of the department. The ones circled in red are represented in Boston in the regional office. Um, the one in the dotted lines on the bottom, and for those of you who are um, in particular in the substance abuse or mental health um, area, um, is SAMHSA. And it is dotted because right now there is no um, staff presence of SAMHSA in any of the regional offices, but by the end of 2012, there will be in every region. Um, and we're looking forward very soon to being joined by a SAMHSA colleague right here in the regional office. So that will, that will bode very well for the relationships between you, um, the grantor-grantee relationships in um, SAMHSA. So the other 
Um, some of the other divisions represented, in addition to the four that um, who, who are joining me today, um, the FDA, the Office for Civil Rights, um, the Office of Public Health and Science, where the Women's Health, Minority Health, Family Planning Services um, are housed, are just another um, few examples. Preparedness and Response also has a uh, presence in the regional office. So I'd like to show this slide, the signing ceremony of the Affordable Care Act with um, President Obama on the left um, and uh, on the right with Secretary Sebelius and the quote, which is um, something we of course are mindful of every day after a year of striving, after a year of debate, and after a historic vote, healthcare reform is no longer an unmet promise. It is the law of the land, and is, it is that law of the land that we work every day to make sure that um, we all understand and know about and that it's implemented as effectively as possible um, here and everywhere. And I, I, al I also sometimes offer a friendly amendment to the president here. It seemed like it was an awful lot longer than one year um, of striving and one year of faith, um, and it's going to be even many more years um, than that as we realize all the benefits into full implementation. Um, this slide is just to remind us that every day um, you heard from um, Representative Cicilline some of the statistics about the real lives that we know the Affordable Care Act has already touched. Um, every day there are stories like that. Um, when I go to visit places um, here in Rhode Island and elsewhere, I learn of some of those stories. You all are the sources of those stories and we need to know about them and we want to support um, support you in celebrating those successes as well as identifying with you the challenges you have that we can better, um, better address. So um, invite me to visit you where you work or where you live. Um, that is how we learn about this and how we learn best about what you need. Um, some of the themes in the Affordable Care Act. So it expands coverage. It seeks to make health care more affordable. It seeks to improve quality, to offer new consumer protections and consumer choice, and gives prevention, the principles of, princi principles of prevention and public health, a new um, elevated visibility. It's no longer a um, just one other area uh, within um, the, the Department of Health and Human Services. It's necessarily integrated into all of the work that the, the department does. Some of the examples of expanding coverage, um, we call bridge programs to get us to 2014 when the state-based health insurance um, exchanges are um, expected to be fully <coughs> operational. Um, one is the small business health insurance tax credits, which I mentioned, which are not just tax credits, they're also subsidies for those businesses that are nonprofit. Um, the Early Retiree Reinsurance Program, which is a bridge for um, those employers, usually larger ones, um, who um, are able to be supported with funding uh, directly from the department to support their contributions to the health insurance premiums of their workers who retire prior to the age of um, eligibility for Medicare. And the cities of Providence and Pawtucket are um, two uh, of the employers um, just locally that are enrolled in that program. Um, and the pre-existing condition insurance plan. Um, that is uh, something that is intended, again, a bridge until 2014 when no <coughs> plans can exclude um, anyone um, on the basis of a pre-existing condition and is meant to um, provide access to folks in the meantime. Other examples, the health insurance exchanges which I talked about, um, which are going to be fully operational um, here and elsewhere. Uh, you should know that Rhode Island, as an, uh, uh, the state of Rhode Island as a grantee of um, several large awards in exchange planning is well ahead of the curve and providing a model for the development of state-based health insurance exchanges and that model is being shared with um, other states. Um, expansions in Medicaid, the expanded coverage for adult dependent children up to age, up to their 26th birthday who can be covered um, already under um, uh, their family's health insurance plan if it's um, eligible. And rebuilding the um, are meant to invest in what we know to be a new demand um, for a strong and stable um, infrastructure of delivery of healthcare services right into the neighborhoods where you um, live and work now um, to support what we 
hope will be um, increased demand by more than 30 million newly insured Americans. So you'll, you'll hear some more about that too. Um, some of the ways in which the Affordable Care Act already is um, seeking to make health care more affordable. Um, no more cost sharing for preventive care, and right now already um, Medicare beneficiaries um, have a range of preventive services available to them at no out-of-pocket costs, no deductibles um, applying at all. Um, and Medicare beneficiaries have already seen some relief in their prescription drug costs. Um, new funding directly from the department, this is another example of the close relationship between the department, closer uh, between the department and our partners in the states. Relief um, for states to increase their uh, capacity for oversight of insurance rate review. Um, and new restrictions on, as the congressman also mentioned, um, medical loss ratios, which is that um, percentage of every premium dollar that goes directly to patient care versus um, other expenses. Healthcare fraud and prevention, um, which prom has the promise of tremendous savings um, for the Medicare and Medicaid programs, money that is much better um, used and invested in care for those beneficiaries rather than paying fraudulent claims. Um, Secretary Sebelius and Attorney General Eric Holder, in this picture with her, um, have teamed up to really increase the joint enforcement and uh, in, in prevention and detection of Medicare and Medicaid fraud using new predictive tools. Um, just as credit card companies for um, so many years have been able to call you up and say, did you really just buy 50 TVs in Cleveland? Um, so can the, the, those tools be used to know that provider John Smith um, can't be in, with a unique Medicare provider number, can't be in seven different cities performing the same diagnostic tests or um, other services um, on the same day. Those are um, newly renewed and strengthened efforts and, as I said, have the promise for tremendous savings. Improving quality, um, encouraging the continuity of care in integrated health care systems, um, lots going on in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, especially now, um, between the Innovation Center, which is um, supporting innovations by providers in um, delivering much more effective and efficient care and safer care, and the development of accountable care organizations and the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which is a current um, uh, proposed rule that's out for um, comment and review. New consumer protections and consumer choice. Um, this is one area where I, I often want to remind folks that there are, these new consumer protections are historic in most states. We are fortunate here in New England. Many of the states have, um, have already offered by state law many of the uh, protections and um, availability of choice that now all states are going to be, that folks in all states are going to be benefiting from. Um, also mentioned already. Um, New uh, rights to appeal insurance company decisions, internal and external review. Now, as part of the Affordable Care Act, will be strengthened in states. And as I said, this in elevated um, uh, visibility and platform for the role of public health and, and the principles of prevention and what we do, and the new creation of the new Prevention and Public Health Fund. And this is um, uh, an example of the range of um, authorized um, funding for that fund from year to year uh, through 2019. Examples of funding that's already um, gone to the state of Rhode Island in community and clinical prevention and public health infrastructure are there too. And community transformation grants, which is um, a really, uh, again, another current um, grant opportunity uh, for um, communities. Um, which is another area of strength and partnership between the department and, um, and um, our partners in the states. And there are five areas, tobacco-free living, uh, active living and healthy eating, and the others. Um, this builds on the previous Communities Putting Prevention at Work program that was created under um, the Reinvestment and Recovery Act, um, of which the statewide obesity um, uh, collaborative is a grantee here in Rhode Island. Workplace wellness grants, um, 
um, which have been authorized and the development of what those are going to include. These are for employers um, under 100 employees. Those are being developed now. Some, some examples of the implementation timeline of the Affordable Care Act, that, um, some of which you already heard mentioned. Um, this is a marathon of implementation. There are provisions becoming effective um, month by month, year by year, um, and it's not just 2014 um, in which we'll be seeing new provisions becoming effective. And I'll, I'll just conclude with, uh, or almost conclude with one of uh, a quote from my, my, uh, my secretary, our secretary. At the end of the day, it really is our goal um, for all Americans to live healthier, more prosperous, and more productive lives. Um, that is a goal that um, preceded the Affordable Care Act, I would say. Um, it certainly is strengthened and supported by us now. Um, some examples of some resources. Um, Whitehouse.gov has um, a health reform area on its website. Healthcare.gov, which I'm going to show you some screenshots of, really um, often called a one-stop um, one shopping place for all things health reform and Affordable Care Act. I think it's really um, the, the first stop, um, and you'll see how many, what the potential is for the resources. Healthcare.gov not only has information about specific provisions of the Affordable Care Act, but does link to um, um, grant opportunities, new announcements um, of funding. Um, also, the first ever really um, transparent, including with cost information, insurance marketplace, where you can <coughs> enter some pretty basic demographic information, nothing more identifiable than your zip code to start. Um, and it will generate, with comparative cost information, uh, different insurance um, plan options that may be available to you. It was um, last fall translated into Spanish in Cuidado de Salud.gov. Um, really a tremendous resource for you and for the folks that you um, you serve. Um, here's some screenshots uh, from the particularly finding insurance options. So individuals, Rhode Island is the state selected there. Um, are you losing health insurance? You had to work. Do you need health insurance? Is the first. How old are you? Um, do any of the following apply? Do you have a disability? Um, are you? Do you have a dependent under 21? Do you, are you pregnant? Um, are you a veteran status? Are you American Indian um, or Alaska Native? And then it will generate um, what some of the um, options are for you. And within each of those options, specific plans um, with great information. And again, requires um, digging into, but this is the first time there's really such a level of comparative information in every state. Um, finally, I'll just leave you with my contact information. Um, Christy.hager at hhs.gov is my email, um, and um, I mean it when I when I say if there's anything that um, any questions you have that may not just be necessarily for the uh, myself or the office of the regional director or any um, um, resources I can connect you with, please contact me. Um, if you would like to invite me to visit you where you work, um, please do that um, through my email as well um, or by phone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will end there because there is so much information about the grants that you're going to hear from my wonderful colleagues. But I thank you very much, um, and it's really, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you. Questions now or, or later? Oh, sorry. Any questions as we're ready, real quick? Okay. Looks like hearing none. Um, you want to hear about the money. That's the money. <laughs> that's coming. Uh, your next presenter is a nutritionist, an award winner. Um, he's, he's got the longest introduction of any of the presenters because I think his knowledge is there. He's been around for a while. Um, you're going to be hearing from Joseph Carlin. He's been a regional nutritionist with the U.S. Administration on Aging since 1976. Uh, he's got a degree in business. Uh, he's got a degree in human nutrition. Uh, from the Department of Food Service and Human Nutrition at UMass Amherst. Uh, he's been in a position with the Associate Director with the New England Gerontology Center at UMA uh, U University of New Hampshire. He's a professional m member of the American Dietetic Association and the Institute for Food Technologies. He's a, uh, presently a member of the Board of Editors for Nutrition Today. He served as an Associate Editor and Contributing Editor with the Oxford Encyclopedia on Food and Drink in America in 2004. 
One more job. <laughs> He's a past recipient of the ADA Foundation Award for Excellence in Community Dietetics and a Charter Fellow of the ADA. And in 2002, he won this fabulous award with the Massachusetts Meals on Wheels, honored him with this 2002 Kit Clark Award. And for the past 12 years, Joe has been a facilitator in the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute in UMass Boston. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Carlin. Law. <laughs> I'm sorry I wrote that much. Uh, very good. I want to give you a brief introduction to the Administration on Aging because many of you in this room uh, may not be too familiar with us. Uh, but I know some of you uh, are familiar with the Administration on Aging. Uh, our largest program is home delivered meals for the elderly and also congregate meals. But let me uh, give you a, a little rundown of our organization. There, I got it working. Uh, our national director, uh, Assistant Secretary on Aging, Kathy Greenlee, is being sworn in by Kathy Sebelius. Uh, we're very fortunate to have leadership in our office um, that's so closely connected with the leadership of HHS. Um, Kathy Greenlee was the director of the State Agency on Aging for the state of Kansas when Kathy Sebelius was uh, governor. And even before that, uh, Kathy Greenlee was Kathy Sebelius's chief of staff when she ran for governor. So she's very close. Uh, closely a uh, position to help us. Uh, this chart should knock your socks off. Uh, the Administration on Aging was founded in 1965 because we realized that there was a serious problem in this country and that was the accelerating number of older people in this country and there was very little work being done to prepare for that avalanche of older people coming online. Uh, so the Older Americans Act required the establishment of state agencies on aging. And that's when the Rhode Island Department on Aging uh, was founded. Uh, as you can see, these numbers are really scary. In the red, these are the number of people 85 plus. And if I'm sure many of you are aware in this state that you were one of the first states to have centenarian breakfasts, where the governor actually invited, about 20 years ago, every centenarian in the state to have breakfast with them. And they showed up. <laughs> uh, now you would need a large movie theater in order to house those people because there are so many people just over the age of 100 here in Rhode Island. Uh, this is the 60-plus population in the United States, and in the very dark purple at the bottom, between 19.1 to 22.9 percent of the population, there is Rhode Island. I can assure you it's up there if you can't say it. Uh, one of the three states in New England where older people are aging in place, and you have the highest population densities. What are we watching in the administration on aging? Uh, we know there's a, this population is increasing rapidly, uh, but we're also seeing some decreasing disability. And that may be occurring as a percentage of the population, and that may be because of the advances in taking care of people uh, with disability. Uh, but highly disabled, individuals who used to go into institutions are now out in the community and being taken care of at home. Disability rates decrease more for men than for women, and married people less likely to have disabilities or live in institutions. So we see patterns here of family caregiving taking place. Older people are managing disability with assistive devices at a greater rate than they ever have. And the primary caregivers are spouses and children. 
Someone said one time, if you want to be assured of being taken care of in your old age, make certain that you have five uh, daughters who will survive. <laughs> but most care is not in institutions or nursing homes. It's informal care, and it takes place in the community and in the home. In testimony last week before Congress, our assistant secretary appeared with Rosalind Carter. And uh, I, one of the nice things is when you have webinar, uh, you can just listen to this at your desk. And I was struck by her comments. There are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregiv caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. The mission of the Administration on Aging is very simple, and this has been our mission since the very beginning of 1965, to develop a comprehensive, coordinated, and cost-efficient system of home and community-based services that help older individuals maintain their health and independence in their homes and in the community. Uh, basically, we're, we're organized uh, like this. We, we wait for Congress uh, to initiate changes in the Older Americans Act. And Kathy Greenlee was testifying before Congress this morning uh, at 10 o'clock, realization of the Older Americans Act with a special focus on hunger and malnutrition among the elderly. Uh, we, we are part of the Department of Health and Human Services, but we are just a little blip in the hierarchy. We're only 120 people, if you can believe it, uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services, but we have eight support centers across the country. Uh, we have grown so small in some parts of the country, we've had to close a couple offices. And right now we're managed out of New York City with a regional director. And, but we cover 16 states, three regional areas. Um, but we also work with local service providers. And by the way, this PowerPoint presentation, I made 100 copies. They're on the desk outside. So please grab one on your way out. We are a hierarchical structure of eight regional support centers. 56 state agencies on aging. Well, you say there's 50 states. I counted the stars in the flag, Joe. But we reckon uh, we have two, actually, in our <coughs> tri-regional area. Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands are part of the territory that we cover, uh, the federal regions one, two, and three. Also, the Mariana Islands, the Trust Territories of the Pacific, and the District of Columbia. We have 629 area agencies on aging. Virtually all of our money is given to the states in what are called formula grants. You tell us the number of people you have in your state, and you get that percentage or share of the whole pot of money that Congress has appropriated for aging services. But if some of you have done, if you did the math on that, Rhode Island would come out in a very poor light. Rhode Island is so small uh, that we hold Rhode Island harmless and give you money that would make your spending comparable to other, to larger states. So, and we do this for about six other states. We expect the state to then either distribute that money to local service providers or award it to area agencies on aging. Rhode Island is what is called a single state PSA, planning and service area. So there are no area agencies. But a state like Massachusetts needs 27 in order to distribute the money and manage it properly. We also award it to 244 tribal uh, and Native American organizations, including the Narragansetts. 20,000 service providers are out there receiving money through this chain, this funnel of uh, our Older American Act dollars going out to the network. 
And we have a group of four organizations that provide technical services to our uh, service providers, including the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Service Programs and the National Association of State Units on Aging and Disabilities. Our regional director is Kathleen Adi, the regional administrator for Federal Regions 1, 2, and 3. I don't have a picture of her because she's so new. Uh, she was formerly the state director on aging for New Hampshire, and we were just lucky enough to recruit her to become our tri-regional administrator. And you have a new director here in Rhode Island. I met her a couple weeks ago, uh, Catherine Taylor, uh, here in in Cranston, Rhode Island. Rhode Island's mission to preserve the independence and dig dignity and capacity of choice for seniors, adults with disabilities, families, and caregivers. Uh, if you go to the website for the Rhode Island Department of Elder Affairs, these are the active links to some of the services that they provide. This is just a partial list. And the contact information is here, and as I said, there's a fact sheet outside. Where to get information? AOA.gov. It can't be any simpler. And when you get to our home page, uh, you can link on to grant opportunities. Uh, as I mentioned, virtually all of our money goes out in what is called formula grants to the state agencies. But a pot of money is always set aside for discretionary spending to test new ideas. And right now, there are several that have just been posted at the AOA website. Uh, we just uh, posted, a, a, we're going to award $14 million in this grant announcement. And it's going to go to four or maybe even as many as seven states. But one of the key requirements in this discretionary grant announcement is that the bidders have to be state agencies on aging. But for you, you don't stop there. You say, the state can't do that alone. They're going to have to partner with people at various levels in the community. So keep that in mind as you read this grant opportunity and say to yourself, what resources do we have in our agency that could help support maybe Rhode Island applying for this grant? You know, in my experience, I've encountered some states sitting back when a grant announcement comes out and saying, well, that's not for us. And then somebody calls up from a local agency and says, hey, have you applied for that yet? and makes an argument, and all of a sudden the state agency turns around and says, hey, maybe we should. So when you read these opportunities, keep that in mind. There's also another grant that we have out there for health care fraud, uh, which was mentioned by Christy Hager. Uh, one of the problems is that Rhode Island is in the least tier of being a problem when it comes to health care <laughs> fraud and waste and abuse. And as a result, there's about 20 states uh, above you who are going to be competing for big pots of money. But there is still some money out there uh, if you put together a good proposal and work with the state uh, to combat health care fraud. And again, you can contact me, and that information is out on the desk. Um, we any of us at the regional office of the Administration on Aging would be glad to work with you, listen to your questions, and put you in touch with the right people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Great job, Joe. Uh, questions for Mr. Carlin? We can take one or two? Absolutely. Okay, hearing none, we're going to move along. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Helen Mulligan is our next presenter. Uh, she's the External Affairs Specialist with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in Boston, the regional office. Uh, one of her primary responsibilities is serving as the liaison with the congressional staff based in New England. 
and prior to joining the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in 1995, she worked as a civilian employee at the, at the Public Affairs Office at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, Helen Mulligan. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted you to know while they're setting me up that um, there's a blue folder. Um, it has my presentation and it has other handouts. And I made like 115 copies, so there's um, definitely an, um, enough for everyone here. So um, if you didn't get one, they are at the table or a box behind the table on your way out. Hi. Um, sorry, yeah, today I'm going to give a CMS overview, talk about legislation, uh, grants, demonstrations, and contracts, and resources. Uh, CMS uh, overview, um, our budget is over $700 billion. Um, we have approximately 5,000 employees and um, about 140 in the regional office. The rest are in, uh, head, most are in headquartered in uh, Baltimore. And we have other regional offices like what Christy Hager showed you, the 10 regional offices in um, HHS. Our regional offices are um, structured the same way. And our programs are serve, we ensure basically um, one in four Americans, uh, almost 100 million Americans actually. Uh, Medicare was created in 1965. We just celebrated the 45th anniversary. I'm not sure if anyone here in the audience knows who the first person who received a Medicare card. Um, but that was, Truman. anyone know? President Truman. Right, okay. I'll be after that test sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It was President Truman, and the second person was his wife. Uh, but Me Medicare um, serves more than 45 million um, Americans. About, about 9 million of, that, of those are disabled, and the others are age 65 and older. And um, we have four uh, programs, Medicare Part A, which is hospital insurance, Part B, which is um, medical insurance, like physician services and outpatient. Part C is um, the, prescript, uh, the uh, Medicare Advantage plans. They're um, like HMOs, which you see, think of your HMOs and other types of plans. And the most recent is Part D, and that's uh, prescription drug coverage. Uh, Medicaid is a joint federal and state program, and it provides coverage to more than 50 million people across the country. And um, the coverage for, um, it's different in every state, but there are some mandatory categories, um, which are shown here, um, children, pregnant women, um, older people, disabled and blind who meet um, poverty limits. And the Children's Health Insurance Program um, ensures 7.7 .7 million children who are not eligible for um, Medicaid, but uh, their families are of lower income. Other programs and activities we have are um, clinical laboratories, inspections, and that's actually self-funded by fees. We also oversee quality of um, Medicare and Medicaid providers. Those are um, hospitals, nursing homes. <laughs> Um, rural health clinics for people to be certified and receive federal dollars, they do have to meet um, certain standards. And um, we usually contract with the state. In Rhode Island, it's a, the, you know, the public health department, we call it the state survey agency that does um, most inspections when we need them. And we also contract with uh, quality improvement organizations and Ed State Renal Disease Networks to improve quality and oversee quality. Uh, this is a, a new program that uh, is part of the uh, recovery, uh, the Affordable Care Act, excuse me, and it uh, moved from uh, Department of Health and Human Services to our agency a couple of months ago. And one of the, I think Christy Hager uh, mentioned some of these, but uh, pre-existing uh, condition insurance plans, early retiree program, um, setting up exchanges, our agency will now be responsible for that. I uh, just wanted to give you some local information. Um, in Rhode Island, um, more than 400,000 um, people are insured by um, CMS programs, Medicare, Medicaid, health program. Uh, is, I think it was Christy or Joe, I think they both talked a little bit about legislation, but federal programs are enacted and um, you know, voted in by Congress, and um, we 
we follow whatever uh, whatever's passed. And um, some recent legislation includes um, MIPA, which uh, Patients and Providers Act of 2008, uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program reauthorization, um, the Recovery Act, and um, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, just some highlights. I, a couple of people have mentioned the Affordable Care Act, but uh, if for those um, seniors on um, they received prescription drug benefits. Um, they did receive, if they had high costs, they received a 250 rebate check last year. And this year, they're receiving a 50% um, cut, in, I mean, excuse me, 50% um, of their drugs will be paid for if they reach the donut hole, which we call the coverage gap, and that will be closed by 2020. Um, there's also changes in the enrollment period. Uh, it used to be um, run from mid-November till the end of December. But then what would happen if someone changed their drug plan um, December 31st, they may present at the pharmacy the first couple of days in January, and um, there would be problems. They couldn't get their medications right away. So that has been changed. Um, the Affordable Care Act also um, does reduce subsidies to Medicare Advantage plans. And um, it strengthens um, the Medicare program by, um, I think, which a couple of speakers already mentioned, um, really fighting fraud and abuse. Um, preventive services, which a couple of speakers also mentioned, but um, eliminate uh, deductibles and co-payments um, for a lot of the services. And for the first time in Medicare, there's a free annual wellness visit. And um, this visit is, um, it's not, per se, like it's, it doesn't include blood work, but it does include a, pay, a, a beneficiary can go to the doctor's office, sit down, and uh, the doctor, it's really time for the beneficiary to talk to the doctor and go over their, what their health issues might be, and for the doctor will take some just general screenings like blood pressure and uh, things, temperature, things like that. Talk about the Affordable Care Act, um, and I think Christy Hager, Hager mentioned it. What changes in 2014 for the states and Medicaid is that um, instead of just certain, um, like before I mentioned, I think ch uh, pregnant women, children under age 19, um, elderly, um, disabled, blind people with certain income had to be covered. But others with low income did not have to be covered. Um, and so that changes in 2014. Um, and it, it, the income level is 133 percent and below, and there is no asset test. Um, another thing, the Affordable Care Act is established a center for Medicare and Medicaid innovation, and these are different types of ways to pay for services or to test out new services. And this is where you may be you may be seeing in the future um, more grant opportunities or um, you know, contracting opportunities. Uh, another um, act recent that I just wanted to go into a little more detail is high tech. And um, that's part of um, the Recovery Act. And what that does is it provides incentive payments to physicians and to hospitals if they establish um, electronic health records that's interchangeable. And um, the payments um, are $27 billion over 10 years. And hospitals um, can receive a couple of million dollars and eligible professionals, um, doctors in certain categories, and, uh, and Medicaid, it includes expanded, it's more than just doctors, um, but they can receive 44000 or 63000 over a period of uh, four or five years if they, um, if they um, get into, uh, if they establish what they call meaningful use, that records can be shared and exchanged. Um, Next, I just wanted to talk about, about grants. That's why you're here. But uh, um, CMS does have um, grants. I have personally have never seen a grant. I'll have to tell you that. They, they do go to our, um, our headquarters. Um, and our grants, a lot of them are large grants. And a lot of them go to states. Um, one grant, um, it, there's two grants here that have been around for, I think, 13 years or more. And one grant, the application is due uh, in two days. So if you want to take a look, <laughs> I have a <laughs> go to grants.gov, and um, and actually that's a specific uh, website for the Hispanic application guidelines for research. 
And also in your um, folder, there is um, a, a, a one page specifically on this grant. Some grants, recent grants um, for uh, electronic health <coughs> systems, um, $11 million to Rhode Island Quality Health, health Institute, uh, yeah, Rhode Island Quality Institute, excuse me. Um, received two grants, one for $11 million and another for $15 million. And um, East Bay Community Health Action Program in Newport received uh, $1.5 million. And this is all to help to establish um, electronic health records. Affordable Care Act, um, recent grant $1.3 million to the state of Rhode Island to um, do criminal background checks and to, you know, help improve um, abuse in um, nursing homes. And in February um, this year, we announced 100 million in new Medicaid prevention grants. And these are for preventive services, and states can apply for money as part of this grant. Um, also in Rhode Island, in all the states, there's something called the State Health Insurance Programs. And these are wonderful organizations um, that basically help Medicare beneficiaries with their health insurance <coughs> options, help them try to, if they need help, um, you know, plan, if, figuring out what plan is good for me, if they want to get a prescription drug plan, if, if they just need help. And um, I think the point is one of the, it, it, Rhode Island received some, some of this money, and just in um, April it was $245,000. Uh, research and demonstration projects are another way um, that money gets um, funneled to um, states and um, other organizations. And um, have an, I announced that FedBizOps Fed is, um, is where you can get information on contracting opportunities and other opportunities um, that, that aren't grants, but they're other uh, contracts. And um, there's an active uh, projects report that lists um, all the current projects. And I have actually in your packet one page, it's 150 pages or something. So I just did, uh, I printed the first page and had, um, and on top of it there's a link where you can get that information to see what types of uh, contracts and grants we do. I earlier mentioned um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, where you know it's, there's lots of things that will be coming up in, in the next couple of years to try to improve and try new ideas for patient care and health care. But um, Rhode Island, um, this, the state, Rhode Island Medicaid, is one of eight states that was selected to participate in a project to avail evaluate um, the effectiveness of doctors and the health care professionals and by coordinating payments. Um, CMS also, they said it was in the demonstration projects, also with contracts. We, um, we have a variety of contracts, and um, actually with our, I think I said our program was $729 uh, million. We process one billion claims a year, that's for Medicare alone. So we have contractors that run these programs, and those are huge contracts, but there are all, all types of other contracts, even for um, our equipment in our offices. And these opportunities are also can be found on FedBiz, FedBiz Talks. Um, I have in your uh, pamphlet um, a page that has resource information, a separate sheet. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out on um, this page is um, open door forums. We have um, national calls, teleconference calls, and we have them for like ambulance, um, ambulance companies. We have um, one for hospitals. We have one for physicians. We have one for skilled nursing facilities. We have durable medical equipment suppliers. There's one, I think, for advocacy groups. And you can join, you can participate in these calls you can even sign up so you're on like a, um, a national um, listserv. So if there's certain re press releases we put out or something that has, um, that's connected with that, you will get it automatically. So it's just something I wanted to mention. For Medicare, we have um, operator service um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even Christmas and all the holidays. And um, is it just a pictures of some of the websites? Um, that's Medicare.gov 
And that's specifically really for Medicare beneficiaries and their caregivers. There's even a separate um, caregiver site. Um, this is our um, CMS.gov. And this, this website is good for getting um, statistical information. And also up the top, you'll see like, um, I think there's press or news where you can get uh, all the current news releases. There's um, information on, I think, legislative hearings you can get. But this is um, more for the provider groups and business groups. This is grant, uh, just a picture of grants.gov. And this is our Fed, Fed date. And you can search for more than 29,000 active uh, federal opportunities. So there are um, a lot of opportunities out there. And that concludes my presentation. And I think, um, I think I mentioned everything in your handout. Uh, I also have something on the pre-existing condition insurance plan. And um, I think that's about it. Some, also, uh, just one other thing. I have an innovator's guide to navigating Medicare. So we get calls sometimes in our office, like, I developed uh, a new system, or why doesn't Medicare pay for this if I do it in a certain way? It, it, we just get those types of questions, and so um, I just have this one page on the website because this is like a 70-page document. But uh, that is where you can get information if you're in the, the provider world or if you have new innovations and new payment ideas, you can uh, send them to us. And um, I think that's all, but I will be here at the end. Um, I will be staying um, to the end, but if anyone has questions right now, I guess I can answer a couple. If not, you can come to me after um, the presentation. Are there any questions right now? No? Okay, thank you. Yes. Across ACS programs, um, her responsibilities include helping state agencies and community-based organizations develop, uh, develop broad, broad family strengthening initiatives, including responsible fatherhood strategies to address the needs in the interests of fathers. Very, very interesting. And she also serves as the region's faith-based and neighborhood partnerships <coughs> liaison. So ladies and gentlemen, Marilyn Lasky. familiarity with all the different departments, or at least in several of them, because many of them do provide uh, programs and services for low-income uh, families and children, and that's our interest at ACF. And we do partner with a number of these um, other agencies on some of our projects, special initiatives, and even some of our funding. So HUD, for example, is one that you should take a look at. Uh, agriculture runs the SNAP program. Uh, Department of Education has early learning opportunities, and we are the, the funding source for Head Start, but we do joint activities with the Department of Education and the Department of Justice in the, in, uh, the Attorney General's office. Uh, they do a lot of work with uh, juvenile justice, with uh, folks coming out of incarceration, and that's one of the interests that we also share with them. Uh, this is the slide that um, Christy showed, and it's all of HHS, just so you get a sense. Um, HHS programs represent about 35% of the total number of federal domestic programs, over 2,000 programs, and this is the largest number for any one department. So we're a big organization. And again, uh, we're, we do work across these boxes, not always as, as well as we'd like to, but we're doing better. Um, so it's, it's good to have a familiarity uh, with the other parts of HHS. So we are part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We provide leadership and create opportunities for families to live uh, productive, economically and socially productive lives. We work largely with state agencies. That's where most of our funding goes. Uh, but we also work with local governments, uh, 
nonprofit, community-based, and faith-based organizations, and private industry, and ACF itself operates over 60 programs. We have 10 regional offices throughout the country. Uh, my office is in Boston, but we serve all of New England. Um, and most, uh, we have representation for the major programs that ACF operates in the regional office. <coughs> So I'm assuming that many of you have never heard of the Administration for Children and Families, but that you'll recognize a number of the programs up here. And in addition to these, we have programs for uh, refugees who are resettling in this country and a number of, of other smaller programs. But, um, you can see it's a wide range of programs that, um, that we operate. So how does our money get out to the community? As I said, the majority of our funding goes to uh, state agencies. That's about 80% of our funding. Uh, we also provide funding to community-based nonprofits, to uh, faith-based organizations, and we also fund things called uh, clearinghouse, which are essentially research or research gathering places. Um, we have one, for example, on the National Fa Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse, um, we have a national um, clearinghouse on families and youth, another resource center for community-based child abuse prevention, uh, a resource center for tribes. Uh, we have one for our assets initiative. And they're good places to check out. You'll find links to, to many of them on our website. And I have more information at the end of the presentation. Um, but they're a good place to get a, a sense of some of our initiatives, some of the research that, that um, informs our programs, uh, and just they're, they're, they're interesting places to spend a little time on. So here's sort of a, an abbreviated uh, picture of our programs. We have self-sufficiency programs. Uh, we have programs that are focused on children, youth, and families, Head Start, uh, <coughs> Runaway and Homeless Youth, uh, home visiting programs. Again, we, we partnered with some of our sister agencies in HHS uh, to fund some of those. And we have uh, programs that are specifically focused on community social services block grant, community services uh, programs. Uh, most of our programs are funded through mandatory formula-based programs that go to states. Uh, and then we also have discretionary and competitive um, programs. And I would say, I think, to echo something that um, was mentioned earlier, it's important to know who your um, state folks are in your community. Many times they need community resources to help them get the work done. Uh, so your CAP agency, your uh, TANF organization, there's a your child care folks, there's opportunities to, you know, first of all, understand what they do and how they do it, and then see where your services may uh, help them in their, their missions as well. Uh, job readiness, uh, parent education, those are some of the areas that we have interest in, and, you know, you're probably the experts in those areas. Uh, so some of the programs, I'll just have a list of the programs that are, are typically um, the ones that are administered by state and sometimes tribal uh, organizations. Again, this is about 80% of our funding. Um, they're typically, the amount that the state gets is based on a formula, for example, the number of uh, children living in poverty in a certain state. Uh, so that, that, that's why we call them formula grants. And our discretionary programs are listed here. Um, and I wanted to focus in on one, which is our Assets for Independence. We have a large assets initiative, and it's really around helping low-income folks, particularly low-income working folks, to um, begin to be build their assets. It's not just about getting a job. We all know we have to have some money in the bank. Uh, so it features financial education, matched savings accounts, helping people to um, 
get banked and manage their credit and improve their credit reports, um, linkages to tax filing services, and we're running this across, trying to run this across all of our programs. So we have special programs for families with children. We have uh, a special asset <coughs> demonstration for um, non-resident, non-custodial fathers, uh, folks with disabilities. We have one that's targeted to our tribal grantees. Uh, so as I said, they're, they're operating across, um, across all of the ACF programs. And um, in addition to that, we have our Assets for Independence um, program. And we don't have any grantees in Rhode Island, so we're anxious for people to learn about it. I left a lot of information out on the table. Uh, we're especially interested in, in, in seeing if we can work with some folks in Rhode Island um, to apply for one of these grants. The funding cycle for the current fiscal year is now closed, but we anticipate, and there's information about this, three funding opportunities in 2012, <coughs> one in January, one in March, and one in May. It's a very flexible program. Um, you can apply for a grant to serve as few as five people, for example. Uh, up to a large number of people, so you know it's it's a it's a somewhat complicated program. You have to have a, a solid relationship with a fiduciary organization. Um, you have to provide a, a set of uh, services for your participants, um, and the the, the 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 highlight of the program are these match savings accounts, so that people commit to saving X amount of dollars out of their weekly or <coughs> bi-weekly bi paycheck, and that amount is matched up to a, up to a cap. Period. That money can be used for any one of three purposes, to purchase a home, for post-secondary education, either for the individual or for a child, um, or to start or expand a business. So it's an exciting program. And I would, if you're at all interested, I, I would encourage you to think even about some of your staff who may be um, eligible, income eligible. I know we're, we're, we're trying this out in our Head Start programs. Many of the staff in Head Start programs are former <coughs> Head Start parents. They're, they're, it's up to 200% of poverty, and there's other ways of cutting that. Um, so many of the, the staff at, say, a Head Start program or a child care um, program might be eligible for this in order to get um, certification. Um, these days we're requiring at least a BA uh, for our, our Head Start uh, teachers so it can help them get their credentialing. It can help them help their children to get further education. Um, we're also interested in um, home-based providers, especially if there's, um, you know, like a local network in Pawtucket of people who do uh, family daycare. Um, that's a small business. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to see if I can get going is if there's some kind of network, they might be able to to get some economies of scale by having some professional bookkeeping or whatever they need, purchase certain uh, equipment or things that they need for their business as a group. I mean, I think it's, you know, just think about it and, and don't box yourself in. It's a very exciting um, program. And as I said, for years and years, there's been money left on the stump. We've, we've had this out there uh, for a number of years, and we've had multiple um, uh, times that we put this announcement out there, and there's always been money left on the, on the table. Um, so, and I think anybody who's interested and serious about it, um, you know, has a great opportunity, because as I said, we're seeking folks in New Hampshire. I mean, in Rhode Island, we have no grantees in Rhode Island, so it's a real, I think that's a plus. Um, so uh, my contact information is, is at the end, and check the tables I brought, I brought information about it. But we also have um, available to us uh, a consultant who's worked 
two consultants, actually. They both worked um, in this field for a long time. They're avail available to meet with you, to talk with you, to help you through um, the application process, to direct you to the resources that we have that can make it a little bit easier. So I wanted to... I know that um, the Congressman's office asked me to speak about a couple of other um, announcements that are they're due in, in a matter of 10 days or so. And I looked at them and I would just say I, I brought information about them, but um, <coughs> one is for a clearing house and basically, you, have, you know, we typically give those kinds of grants to um, educational organizations. Uh, folks who are familiar with research, who do research, who run big libraries and know how to collect and make research available. So there's information about that, but I, I didn't necessarily think it was appropriate to this audience. Um, and there's another, um, another. I, I don't know what the situation is um, in, in this community, but we have a community economic development grant that's currently open. It's actually, the application is due July 11th, um, and something I'll, I'll touch on uh, a little bit later. Uh, you have to be a, a CDC, a community development corporation. I don't know if there are folks who are in those agencies or perhaps work with organizations <coughs> who are CDCs, and they're um, they're awarding bonus points for projects that address the elimination of food deserts. And that's one of the things I wanted to mention in our discretionary grants. Often, um, the administration, the White House, will, will um, initiate uh, an, uh, a particular priority that they're, that they're interested in, in moving ahead. So that, that's an example of one of them. And it certainly fits in with the first ladies. Um, let's move healthy eating um, initiative. So here's a here are a bunch more uh, discretionary grant programs. Um, I would tell you to be on the lookout because we're about to um, announce some funding that would be available for community-based uh, responsible fatherhood programs and for um, what we call healthy relationship programs. <coughs> and, uh, we expected it last week. Uh, they weren't announced yet, and we expect that um, the secretary will be announcing them this week. Um, I think I covered just about everything. Yeah, I just wanted to go over some of the funding cycles, because it may help folks. Our, our federal fiscal year runs from October 1st, um, for example, October 1st, 2011, through September 30th of the following year. That will be FY12. And our, um, our discretionary programs are typically released from March through July. That gives us enough time to to gather the applications and for them to be thoroughly reviewed and vetted so that we can actually issue the, the money uh, that Congress has appropriated for this fiscal year by the end of the fiscal year. And then you have a period to actually implement the program um, beyond that. Um, so, so we don't really, the, the only grant announcements that I'm anticipating are these responsible fatherhood and healthy relationship grants, um, and they better come out quickly, <laughs> otherwise we won't have time to, to review them. Um, but it's also a good time to, to sort of get your act together. Uh, somebody mentioned grants.gov, um, the other uh, information source that you should be a aware of is the Catalog for Domestic uh, Assistance, Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. Um, and I brought a couple of copies and then um, photocopied the first page with the link. This is the, um, this is the Administration for Children and Families sort of mini uh, CFDA. It has all of our programs listed in here. It tells you what type of um, funding 
whether it's discretionary, formula grant, it gives you the target audience, it uh, tells you who the eligible applicants are, um, and sometimes even gives you a, a contact person. So as I said, I only have a few copies of this, but there's a, a photocopy of the front page with the link at the top, and it's available um, online. And for grants.gov, are, um, are some of you familiar with grants.gov? Have you ever used it? Okay. So you know there's a, a registration process. Um, so now's a good time while things are a little bit at a lull till we gear up again for next year to get registered, to, to do all the, the paperwork to get yourself ready to use grants.gov. I think um, we are one of the few agencies that <coughs> still permits, at least for this year, um, hard copy submittals. Many, many federal agencies are, are going to the electronic um, submittal. And I'm sure we will soon. Um, so it's a good time to get you know, familiar with it. You can peruse current grant opportunities. Grants.gov is where you'll find the, the live funding announcement. And the, the catalog is where you just find a catalog of all kinds of programs. So you have to sort of match up um, the two. I, um, I just put together some grant writing tips and I have uh, a bunch of sheets um, outside on the table if people are interested in grant writing tips as well. Um, you know, be on the lookout for the funding using the, um, the grants.gov and, and the catalog and our materials. And I'll give you a website too because we host the HHS um, grant forecast and you can sign up for it, you can peruse it when we're for forecasting grants, you can sign up for emails so that you get notice of any changes uh, to the grant. And I would just urge you, uh, everybody does good work, I know that, but just you know, try to find a match, it's not always easy, but try to find a, a match between funding up opportunities, ours or anybody else's, that, that meets the mission of your organization and the folks that you're working with. Um, make sure you read the announcements, um, pay attention to the weights we identify, uh, the number of points that you're eligible to receive in each section of our announcement. So don't, you know, don't sweat bullets and waste all your time on, on something that's worth a point. When we're giving 25 points to you know your design of your of your program, um, try to use local data if that's um, possible. And I'm sure the congressman's office can help. City hall can help. Uh, use state information if you can't find local um, information. Um, but try to use your sources. Schools may be able to, to give you, you know, the number of kids receiving free or reduced school lunches that, you know, you can, you can um, use all kinds of local uh, information. Um, tell us who you are, avoid the jargon, spell out your acronyms. Um, we're pretty precise about how to format your, your submission due dates, and, and the like. Um, we're typically looking for programs that are innovative, yet replicable, um, that, that build on the experience of previous grants. So, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to other grantees. You can find information about current grantees on our websites for various uh, programs and, and um, in grants.gov, you can even look at the previous year's announcements to get a feel. And that information um, is available to you. So it's a good way to, to learn where you, you know, you know how to do a certain, you know how to write a budget, but maybe your um, evaluation piece was a little lacking. So you know where to, to work for your next submittal. Um, uh oh, let me just go back. Um, the other thing, the other opportunity that we offer in a number of our programs is to actually be a grant reviewer. Um, 
And if you go to our website, I have some information out on the desk about how you go about being a grant reviewer. We work through a contractor. If you go to our page and in the search box put grant reviewer, it'll you'll pop up the same information. Um, it's a fairly simple process. They ask for your work background, your area of expertise. I think a short writing sample. Um, but it's a good way to, to get some feel for the whole process from the inside. If you, if you work with youth, you know, maybe you would, um, and you're not applying for one of our one runaway and homeless youth grant grants, a basic center or a street outreach, you might be interested in being a reviewer um, for, for when those grant announcements are made. Um, so again, it's, it's a way to learn about the whole process kind of with an inside perspective. So here's my contact information. Feel free to call or email me. Uh, the second address is our website address. Um, the third one is also the email, uh, excuse me, the, the link to this document. Um, the next one is this grants forecast. Uh, it's housed at HHS, but it's we forecast all of, um, I'm sorry, it's housed in ACF on my agency, but on our website, but it's all of HHS's um, grants. And then the, the catalog for um, education and one from labor. We're all looking for similar things, but just so you get a, get a feel for it. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm Jeffrey Beard from the Hearst Regional Office in Boston, and on behalf of Dr. Mary Wakefield, our administrator in Rockville, Maryland, Jeff Reck, our regional administrator in Boston, and all of my colleagues from all over Hearst or across the country, I bring you greetings and a sincere thank you for the chance to come out today and have a chance to share information about Hearst. I gotta thank the congressman for his work on improving access to care. I gotta thank Christy for her great leadership in Region One. I gotta thank Ramon. Let's give Ramon a big hand. Thank you. I sent Ramon a 23 megabyte monstrosity that I couldn't get here, but she got to hear my thank you again. I gotta thank my colleagues from HHS for your great work. And I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today and showing your interest in HHS and hopefully in our HRSA programs. All right, Ramon, I'm going to try to fire it up now. Success. I'm going to uh, get right down to the nitty gritty and talk about HRSA programs. HRSA is America's health care safety net, but we really consider ourselves the access agency. Our mission, our passion is to ensure that everybody has access to high quality care. Okay. We don't care what you look like, where you come from, what you had for dinner last night. We believe you have the right to quality care and we're going to work to make sure that everybody in America has it. We do that through several different programs, some of our bigger programs. We have 80 different programs but these are nuts and bolts programs. Our community health centers program, you've heard of our HCC program in the crowd, if you're familiar with our community health center program, our HIV AIDS program, our funding to maternal and child health, our work in trying to strengthen the workforce in this country, lots of shortages, nurses, doctors, we're trying to strengthen that pipeline, our work ensuring access to primary care in rural health, in rural communities, and our 340B drug pricing program, reduce prices to get access to pharmaceuticals to save folks' lives. We are so very, very, very proud of our community health center program. We reach and serve over 20 million patients across the country in all different settings, rural, frontier, urban settings. We have a network of over 1,100 grantees. We fund um, 501c3 nonprofit corporations to provide care in over 1,100 communities. 
with over 8,000 sites all over the country and in the various territories. 40% of our patients have no insurance. <coughs> Everyone is served. We have a sliding fee scale. So if you have a job and some income, you pay a little, you pay a little. But if you have nothing, person steps in to ensure access to care for everyone. The Affordable Care Act has been a tremendous blessing for HRSA. Our community health center program is going to receive $11 billion over a five year period to expand operation and construction of health centers and services. So as you see here, 9.5 billion of those taxpayer dollars are targeted to create new health center sites in medically underserved areas. <coughs> We're really working hard to expand preventive and primary care services, really focusing on oral health, behavioral health, pharmacy. Huge demand around oral health, huge demand around behavioral health. We're really proud of the $1.5 billion we're investing in major construction and renovation projects across the country. And our goal, it's an ambitious goal, but our goal is to double the number of patients served by 2014 to go from 20 million to 40 million. And we're going to need all the partners in this room and any other room we can find to help us get to that. We're going to need outreach to just be part of uh, discussions to really give us the information we need. In Rhode Island, we have some tremendous health center investment. Blackstone Valley across the street, Ray LaVoy, great program. Promise Community Health Center, Newport, Hope Valley, Hasco, Johnston, Cranston, lots of tremendous community health centers, and we're very proud of the people who work there and the patients they serve. I always I take a moment to really pay homage to the folks who serve people with AIDS. I lost my own brother to AIDS in the mid-80s, and I tell you, they do a tremendous job caring for the half million people with AIDS, and we have over 900 clinics across the country. We also fund, through grants, primary care. We fund through grants, support services. We also really focus on supporting the providers who are caring for people with AIDS, and really giving them a lot of support and technical assistance to really support those folks. In the HIV community, access to care is important, but retention is key, trying to keep folks in care. And once again, HRSA steps in as a payer of last resort for people who don't have insurance. So we step in to ensure everybody has access to quality care. Now, our maternal and child health grants are interesting. The majority of that money goes through states as block grants, and then the state contracts out with different agencies to provide services. For example, for the block grant program in Rhode Island, there's a children with special health care needs program, so we send that money out. Community-based organizations provide those services. We also have individual grant programs, very proud of our Healthy Sun program, providing services to at-risk women in the community. A wonderful, wonderful program. There's a lot of interest in this new childhood home visiting program. ACF, our partner on that, we're excited about that. Uh, these funds are going to go through the state too and a very, very, very good program. What's really good about this program, what I like is this strategy of going into the homes and interacting with the women and the children and really finding out what's going on there and then being able to refer folks to the service they need. So it's a pretty common sense approach and we're very proud to be a partner in that effort. HRSA also is focusing on strengthening the workforce, uh, nursing shortages, doctor shortages, dental shortages. So through Title VII, we give out grants to address those shortages. And also through Title VIII, we fund nursing workforce initiatives. Are folks familiar with the Commission Corps, with the Surgeon General? We have the National Health Service Corps. We have folks 
those in uniform who get a loan or a grant and they go to the neediest areas of the country, be it urban or rural or frontier, to provide medical services. Through the Affordable Care Act, we've been able to invest $300 million to expand the funds for the NHSC. We've been able to, to really increase the number of primary care providers from 4,760 in 2009 to almost 7,400 in 2010, and it really is still climbing. We have over 8,000 approved sites, almost half of CHCs. We're really working to kind of streamline this process. At times, it can be a nightmare trying to work through bureaucracy. We're working hard to simplify the site application process, trying to make sure we have lots of different disciplines that are being uh, sent into communities, and really always working to assess are we doing our job, are we driving folks into primary care when they need it. So kind of a constant self-assessment. But that $300 million is really helping fuel these efforts. The National Health Service Corps is uh, authorized through 2015, which is great. What's very nice is we've been able to increase the loan repayment award from 35000 to 50000 to attract more providers into our programs to get them into the communities. We also have something I think is great, these half-time opportunities, two and four year contracts. Somebody can 20 hours a week contract with us and we can send them into community health centers to work to increase access to care. I love the fact here that, that the, the money is increasing over the five years, steady increasing in NHSC investment, that's great. Rural health, we, we have some very um, innovative programs in terms of telehealth having providers who's in one location treating patients in other locations. That's really interesting. We're supporting rural health hospitals and clinics and providers. We're really helping shape the dialogue around rural health. And in HRSA, we believe in partnerships and collaborations. So we're constantly in contact with local and national leaders talking about these issues. And we, like ACF, also have a major national clearinghouse on rural health information. The administration has been pretty clear of what their three major goals are regarding the Affordable Care Act. One is, like HRSA, greater security and stability to the uninsured, guaranteeing access to care, having insurance for those who don't have it, and really trying to slow the costs. You know, through the papers you read, costs are going up, so we're trying to slow the costs down. For HRSA, we're taking a nuts and bolts approach. We're really trying to build the workforce. We're trying to improve access. We're trying to strengthen that link between public health and primary care and really create this feedback loop. We want to hear from folks, dialogue, and really have that kind of loop. We find out to be very beneficial. Now to the direct money in terms of HRSA. It's all about grants by Grants not good for HRSA. Once you sign up, you'll get a notification of HRSA grants in real time. That's where you want to be in terms of HRSA for grants. Once again, to find a grant opportunity, to apply, review, manage if you get one, it's all about HRSA and grants.gov. This is another federal grants.gov source that I put on the presentation. Here are three major contacts, HRSA, Rockville Central Office, around grants that you folks can take down your information and feel free to contact them directly. Tell them Jeff Beard sent you, have them call, give them a call. And then also, I didn't kill any trees, so you guys got to call me <laughs> in Boston to get more information on grants. And really, you know, I want to hear from you, I want to talk to you about opportunities, really important to continue to dialogue around this. It's a very important time, and thank you for the chance to be here today. And I'd love to feel the question or two, if you got one. Thank you. Any, any questions? Looks like I feel like I ran my key today. Any questions? None? Okay. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for, for being here today. You've been a fabulous audience. Uh, thank you to Director Hager and Joe Carlin and Helen Mulligan and Marilyn Lasky and lastly, uh, Jeff Beard. How about a round of applause for, for their work today? Thank you for assembling us all, and uh, I think we've just closed the